For everyone, good morning to everyone who's with us this morning. This webinar is a part of a series of real-time solutions that is brought to you by the Apple Valley, Burnsville, Hastings, Lakeville, and River Heights Chambers of Commerce. The goal of these webinars is to address business concerns and, and questions as we continue to do business during the pandemic. My name is Krista Jack, and I am the president of the Lakeville Area Chamber of Commerce. And just some housekeeping items this morning, just a reminder that all participants are muted. So please use the Q&A feature to ask questions and we'll get to as many as we can following the presentation. And just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded uh, on, and you will be able to see it on all of our partner websites. And so we are here today, this morning, to hear from Matt Scott. He is a litigation attorney for Doherty, Melinda, Soulfest, Hills, and Bauer, PA. And we've been fortunate to have Matt on a couple of these uh, webinars already. And um, this, what he is gonna cover this morning is a common question we are getting right now. So many of you are wondering as we are starting to open and, and continue to do business during this pandemic, what is your business liability during this and, and how do we kind of protect ourselves as businesses? So, so Matt, thank you so much for being here this morning for talking through, I know you've got a lot to cover. So I am going to, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and take it away. I'll turn it over to you, Matt. All right, thank you. Um, so we're going to cover a few different topics, and um, what I wanted to start off with first uh, is just kind of an overview. You can go to the next slide. Okay. So a lot of businesses are concerned with limiting their liability in this time. Um, you can never eliminate liability completely or the, the risk of potential exposure liability, but you can do a lot of things to uh, limit it. And so I'm going to go through a few different categories. Uh, we're going to focus on employees, customers, government, and then uh, how. And kind of the overarching theme here is be reasonable and be compliant. So you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so limiting your liability, um, you know, be reasonable and be compliant. Um, one of the things uh, that I think is important to think about here is different people have different, um, you know, political or uh, different views about, uh, about COVID-19. And what's important in the long-term outlook is don't be the outlier. Don't be the, the business that uh, didn't care, didn't follow the rules, didn't, um, didn't follow the directions of the government, the CDC. Uh, let the, um, the science uh, be the uh, sort of the touchstone and the framework for what you're doing and how you're doing it uh, with regard to your business. I would also say continually reevaluate. Things are changing constantly, as I'm sure everyone has seen. So from uh, week one to week two to week 10, um, things have changed and you need to reevaluate what, uh, what the data says and sort of the conventional wisdom and what's that, what that's telling businesses to do. Um, be reasonable. One of the things we're going to talk about near the end is the tort of negligence. One of the uh, one of the elements of that looks at what a reasonable person would do under the circumstances. Would a reasonable person drive down Cedar Avenue at 90 miles an hour through a crosswalk in a red light? Um, no, the answer is no. Um, but that is also a, a question you can ask yourself when it comes to running your business and how you treat your employees, and how you treat your customers. Um, also be compliant. You can't be compliant if you don't know what the rules are. So you need to stay informed of the law so you can follow it. Use your payroll provider, your insurance broker, your accountant, um, and your lawyer to, to find best practices uh, and to try to, to follow those. Uh, next slide. So with regard to employees, um, Again, nothing can eliminate risk. Sometimes um, crazy people find crazy lawyers and those lawyers uh, file lawsuits. So I can't, uh, I can't eliminate all risk uh, if I'm a business owner, but I can certainly do a lot to, uh, to limit it. I would say one of the things that you could do, uh, it's a huge favor to yourself, to your business, is go to this link and read this document. I'd read it once a week for the next four weeks. Um, this educate yourself uh, bullet. It's at the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, this will be available. It's a PDF and it goes through all kinds of helpful uh, questions that employers ask about how they treat their employees, what they should do, what they cannot do, what the employees are allowed to do, and what the employer cannot retaliate against the employee for doing. So 
it's something that I, I wouldn't want to um, sort of summarize, cover the whole thing here, but I would definitely recommend that everyone read that uh, information sheet. Also stay up to date, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, and the Minnesota Department of Health are constantly putting out new information. And so um, you can sign up for newsletters uh, that, that are available at this, this other link um, on this stay up to date bullet. Um, another, just a helpful hint uh, and a tool for employers and businesses is that when you terminate someone's employment, which you can do in this time, that you pay a severance. Um, it's not a requirement. Your employees are probably at will employees. They can leave their jobs and they can be fired at will. Um, but if you pay a severance, the severance is always tied to a release. And that release is very robust. It has lots of uh, elements and components that need to comply with state and federal law, including how long an employee has to consider the release. But if you have a good solid release, you at least have uh, really limited the employee's ability to uh, create risk for your, your uh, business going forward. Uh, next slide. So as you are probably aware, you need to have, uh, most businesses need to have a, a plan. So develop a COVID-19 preparedness plan. Uh, one size does not fit all. There are obviously differences in um, the risk associated with certain business types. So, you know, thoughtfully prepare one for your business. Executive Order 2056 is kind of the last uh, information that we have on, on the reopening uh, of businesses. And so uh, in that order, there is a link that says it is a link to uh, a sample plan it's not really a link to a sample plan. It's sort of a link to another page where you get to sort of search around to try to find the sample plan. But this is a link to the sample plan. Um, and there is also industry guidance coming out pretty regularly uh, for the industry that you may be in. So if you click on the industry guidance link, uh, which you can't do by Zoom, but you could do when you get this PowerPoint presentation, um, you'll see that all the industries that are currently available are listed, but then they also have a few that are in the pipeline um, and coming out. And that is very detailed industry guidance. What I would say about being reasonable, coming back to that point, is that when you uh, follow industry guidance that's put out by the state, uh, it's very unlikely that someone's going to, in the future, a year from now or two years from now, be able to come back and say, you know, you were following the, the state's guidance on uh, the the Department of Labor or website or the deed website and uh, that was unreasonable. Most likely it's going to be found to be reasonable and so if you follow that you're going to be in, in pretty good company. Um, if you need help with your plan, uh, Minnesota OSHA will assist uh, or they say they will assist. Uh, as with many of these government agencies, they're very heavily taxed right now uh, from unemployment to, uh, to OSHA. So uh, be patient. There are phone numbers and there's an email to to use if you if you want to call them um, or email them. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, in the workplace, over communication is key in a crisis. So your employees are going to be asking questions. You've already been through this for many months. Um, you need to keep the the concerns of your staff uh, and your customers at the forefront um, and stick with the facts. Uh, the EEOC does allow you to test, uh, so you can test a customer, you can test an employee. Um, that's not the, the typical protocol, it's unique to this pandemic. Uh, you do need to keep it confidential. Uh, you can refuse service to someone who tests, uh, uh, it has a temperature. I think the conventional wisdom is 100.4, but I'm not a doctor, so you may want to check uh, other places for that. Um, Ask about the symptoms. You can certainly ask uh, about the, the employee's symptoms. Um, and if the employee has symptom, symptoms, you can send them home. Uh, you need to keep any records confidential. Um, and you can also do daily compliance checks. Either you can, you can do those as an employer, or you can uh, cause the employee to have to fill out a form that says, you know, they don't have a cough, they don't have a fever, um, and that they uh, don't have any symptoms of COVID-19. If, if someone does get sick in the workplace, you're kind of in a different world then. Uh, you need to really be careful in how you handle that. Um, you need to make sure that you warn other employees um, that they have been exposed. Don't tell them who exposed them. 
Um, and the reality is the Minnesota Department of Health will probably also be in contact with those employees who have been exposed. Um, next one. Um, again, just a reminder, HIPAA does not apply to uh, all employers. HIPAA applies to healthcare providers. Um, but employers of 15 or more are governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so it, that, that does have a protection, a protection component to it um, for employer employee data. Uh, and you, you can't go around telling uh, their coworkers uh, when someone is sick. Smaller employers are also governed by state law as opposed to federal law under the Minnesota Human Rights Act. So um, make sure you understand which law applies to you and, uh, and don't disclose uh, employee uh, illness data um, unless, uh, unless it's uh, without the employees identifying information so that you can protect other employees. Um, employees should be, uh, who, are, who are ill should be isolated at home. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, and read about the Minnesota or the uh, Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, I'm not gonna cover that here, but that has a lot to do with the benefits an employee is entitled to uh, during the 14 days um, that they're sick or uh, other options staying at home if they're caring for someone else or uh, home with children who are home from school. Um, this is not a time to demand a doctor's note or strict compliance with uh, those kinds of requirements that are usually required of an employee who stays home. Um, doctors are not working normal hours. Some uh, family practice uh, physicians are, are on odd rotations. They may not be available to provide a note. Um, so now's not the time you want an employee in the office for two days wondering whether, uh, whether, they're, whether they're ill. Um, uh, next slide. We do have time. So uh, limiting liability to customers. So we're kind of shifting a little bit from employees to customers. I think it's very unlikely that anyone is going to be sued by a customer uh, or by an employee because COVID-19 has caused them to become ill or to die. Uh, I think that's unlikely. I think it's more likely that employees will, uh, will file suits because their rights have been violated in some way. Um, in connection with the laws that have been passed um, to help us navigate the situation. But even, even that said, when, uh, and we're gonna get to this in a little bit, when the, the harm is significant, like a death, um, the, the likelihood of some risk to the employer or the business is higher. It's just naturally higher. Uh, with regard to customers, I would say, um, implement the plan that you have, the coronavirus um, COVID-19 uh, preparedness plan, uh, and have a plan to keep customers safe. It is required for most businesses under Executive Order 2056. Um, and enforce the policies. Don't let your plan slide. Uh, regularly communicate the importance of the plan to your employees because they're the ones that are going to be implementing the plan for your business and protecting customers. So if you say you're gonna sanitize something, uh, whether it's a door handle or a, a conference room table or a chair, actually do it and make sure that you're following up with your employees and encouraging them to comply. Uh, use clear signage for customers so that they know uh, where to go, um, which way to walk, which path to follow. Um, grocery stores are doing this. Um, those things are important to keep customers safe and it's a way that you can help customers understand how you are protecting their health. Document your plan and your compliance. So this is important and it's not something that people think about now. Right now you're thinking about implementing the plan. Uh, what is the plan? How do we follow the plan? But a year from now, two years from now, three years from now when the lawsuit happens, you wanna be able to go back to a notebook, a binder, or something that's been basically frozen in time that shows what you did, how you did it, how you complied, because that person who files the lawsuit is not gonna have one of those binders. And if you have one to show what you did and how you did it, uh, you're gonna be in a better position to document that what you did was reasonable. And we'll get to how that affects the negligence toward, towards the end here. Um, some businesses are obviously high risk and they need to be aware of that risk and take special precautions to prevent 
the high risk behaviors. I think of dentistry. Uh, it's one of the probably the most uh, one of the riskier uh, businesses that has reopened uh, because a lot of the dental procedures cause uh, aspiration, um, coughing. Uh, when people put things in your mouth, you just tend to not want them there, and so. Um, dentistry has, has had to completely shift gears in how it um, deals with PPE. And there are also some other unique risks to other businesses. Obviously, restaurants and salons uh, and gyms have found themselves in a really difficult position. Um, next slide. Um, I wanted to have a slide about the mask because I know it's been coming up a lot lately. <clears throat> this one is, uh, text is kind of small, but you know, I think you're, you're on fairly uh, solid ground to say that if someone doesn't wear a mask, and this is a, a decision each business needs to make, um, I'm not going to say that a business has to require mask wearing, I don't think it does, um, but if you do, I think you can refuse service to someone who uh, doesn't wear a mask in your business. I know Costco is doing that, so <clears throat> you'd be in good company. Um, so and it, obviously we already have done that with shoes and shirts. If you don't have a shoe, you don't have shoes, you don't have a shirt, you can't, you can't come in. Um, so, so again, you're in good company, the governor, the CDC, a lot of recommendations encourage mask wear. Um, I, this is, and this is more of a novelty, but it is a reality, it is a law, that mask wearing is still a crime in Minnesota, technically, I think, and actually, it's on the books. Um, so the law actually reads, a person whose identity is concealed by the person in a public place by means of a robe, mask, or other disguise, unless based on religious beliefs or incidental to amusement, entertainment, protection from weather, or medical treatment is guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, so it's a misdemeanor, up to a $1,000 fine, crazy. And this is not medical treatment. Wearing a mask is, in, in a number of different contexts, has been specifically uh, not defined as a medical treatment when it's used the way we are using it. So um, we're all criminals. Uh, the, the law was originally designed to target the Ku Klux Klan. And so for that had valid justifications. Uh, but now we're all wearing masks, or many of us are. And, uh, and even the aiding and abetting statute makes the governor uh, and the mayor of Minneapolis now uh, uh, liable criminally for uh, encouraging us all to wear masks. So this is all kind of foolish, but it is a reality that this is a law on the books in Minnesota. Uh, I don't think it, it should impact uh, significantly your uh, decision whether your business should require masks or not, uh, because it is not being enforced. And obviously if the governor says we should wear masks uh, and a prosecutor goes out and prosecutes someone for wearing one, um, that's probably going to make a headline and it's probably going to get dismissed. So, uh, but, but the, the crazy reality is that if in, in Minneapolis uh, you wear a mask, it's a thousand dollar up to a thousand dollar fine under state law. But if you don't wear a mask, it's a thousand dollar fine under the Minneapolis ordinance. That's obviously not the way the law is supposed to work, but the legislature is probably not going to change it because as you've seen, maybe, um, this is a partisan issue and, uh, so I don't, I don't see that uh, being modified, but it sure is not getting a lot of press. I will say that. Uh, next slide. So could I be sued? Um, OSHA talks about employee safety um, and, and specifically uh, an employer has a duty to furnish e to each of his, his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. And that's a quote from, uh, you know, from OSHA. So exercise good judgment, put the safety and health of your employees and customers first and work backward from there. Uh, that's just a common sense way to think about uh, your business and the, the safe environment you're providing. Get insurance against the risk. Now is a good time to reevaluate risk. Uh, there may be uh, options out there for insurance. I'm not an insurance broker. I do know that uh, in this environment, there are a lot of people that don't have insurance against the things they thought they had insurance for. And so now is a good time to think about uh, why you don't have it and whether you should buy it uh, if this ever happens again. Next slide. So could I be sued? Uh, you know, I, this is a quote from an article I read online. 
Um, and, and it just reads as follows. These are claims that an employee or as a customer at a business, whether grocery stores or movie theaters, uh, you did not take appropriate actions to safeguard me from the coronavirus. And I've had injury that flowed from that. Uh, and your basic negligence type of claim is a big area of concern. So it's happening. It's out there. Uh, I wanted to look briefly at what is a negligence claim. So if you get sued and you know, litigation is, is what I do. You, the lawsuit starts with a complaint. And the complaint sets forth facts at the beginning, and then it goes into the counts. And one of those counts in, in a lawsuit like this would be for negligence. And in order to, to plead a count of negligence, you have to have the elements all recited in the complaint. And these elements are duty. Uh, you owed a duty of care to your employee or your customer. And then here, what would a reasonable business do? What would the, the reasonable business do? And, and under those circumstances, that would be your duty. And then a breach of the duty, your business failed to meet that duty. Cause in fact, so but for the failure to meet the duty, the employee or customer would not have been injured. And then proximate cause, your failure and not something else caused the injury. And then finally, damages the employee or customer has actually been injured and suffered some loss. So next slide. Um, this is gonna be a focused fight in the future. It's not gonna be, you're not gonna have much control over damages because that is gonna be what it is. The person is gonna be ill, they're gonna have medical expenses, um, and in worst case scenarios, they're gonna, they're gonna die. And so you can't control that aspect of things, but what you can control is what you do right now uh, and so you can impact the, uh, the breach element discussion and the causation discussion uh, by what you do right now. And what I would say is document, document, document. Like I said, have this binder, have this um, documentation that you're preparing about what you did and how you did it. Um, have a plan, keep good records, and follow your plan. And if some, someone does get sick in your business, uh, you'll have an argument that you did not breach your duty. So you had a plan, you executed the plan, and the duty that you had to the customer was satisfied and you, uh, you met your obligation. There is no strict liability. There is no automatic, you are liable if someone walks into your business and they get COVID inside your business if you were following a reasonable plan at the time. So follow the plan and you, and you give yourself better arguments in the future. Uh, the causation argument, COVID-19 is very difficult to track. Um, it's, gonna, it's especially difficult now with community spread. It's gonna become more uh, trackable. And in fact, it sounds like uh, it's one of, one of the uh, clear uh, advances is going to be when they have all of these people tracking every contact that a, an affected person has had so that they can figure, who, figure out who they were in contact with. When it gets to that level of, of specificity, uh, there may be ways to track COVID to a specific business. And, uh, and for that, um, it, it's gonna be uh, relying on public government officials who track down where people were. But again, it comes back to the breach discussion and the impact you can have on whether you were reasonable by following your plan. Uh, the damages argument, again, where loss of life occurs, there is just a very significant harm uh, that results. Now, whether that harm is someone's fault uh, is, is a question for a, a different time, but the, when the harm is significant, the, the tendency to want to, uh, to get re revenge, I wouldn't say revenge, but uh, to be made whole is greater than if the harm is, is low. Uh, next slide. Um, I think this is the last slide, and I, and I wanted to just say one thing about limited liability entities. Almost all of you probably have an LLC or a corporation, or an LLP or an LP, or, and there are just a variety of different limited liability uh, entities out there. And that means that your investment into that entity, if it's $100,000, that's what you put at risk. You don't put your million dollar house at risk. You don't put your cars at risk. You put that $100,000 into the entity and you could lose it. But if you lose it, uh, that's how the entity is supposed to work. 
But there's also an argument that's made sometimes called veil piercing or piercing the corporate veil, where uh, the person thinks that when they put the 100,000 in, that's all they risked. But in reality, they mix their personal money with their business money. Uh, they let their entity expire. They didn't have insurance and they were doing some kind of high risk activity. Under those circumstances, courts will sometimes say that your entity was a shell or a sham and I'm going to allow this litigant to come through the entity and come uh, to you personally. That means your personal assets are on the line. That means your family is potentially uh, jeopardized for the, the financial health of your family. So don't, don't treat your business entity uh, like a sham or a shell. Treat it like a real thing. It should have its own bank account. It should have its own um, uh, existence. You should follow corporate formalities by having meetings, taking minutes, and, um, and you, would, you won't expose yourself to a bail piercing argument. I would also say that lots of businesses forget that you need to renew your entity status on a regular basis. So this link is to the, so the Secretary of State's website. You can go to the website. It's to a page that allows you to search for your business, put the business name in under the active uh, box checked. And if you see your business and it says it's active, great. And all the information is up to date, great. But if, it's, if you don't see it, check the box for inactive and search again. If you find your business in the inactive category, that's not a good thing. Uh, and it potentially eliminates some of that protection businesses will have to COVID-19 uh, risk. Uh, you wanna just put your business at risk. You don't wanna put your, your personal assets at risk. And with that, I think it's, I think, oh. I, that's well, going. you've got, Matt, you've got one more slide, I think, here. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, oh this one is a, a minor one, limiting liability to the government. Um, no. So this one is uh, avoid government penalties by pro providing required notices and then follow the executive orders. These executive orders have very large penalties in them, potentially. Uh, I don't think it's very likely they will be enforced. On a, on a broad uh, scale, but there are possibilities that if you really uh, don't follow them and you make a, a big uh, you you make a big deal out of not following them, you're going to draw some attention, and you can potentially put your business at risk that way. Um, and I would say to avoid terminations that violate employee rights, check with your payroll provider, your HR department, your attorney uh, to to run by them. Uh, the, the fact scenario you have before you terminate an employee's uh, employment. And uh, don't cut corners. Um, that's, the, that's the bottom line. This is a very day-to-day um, -day kind of situation. Uh, continue to read and educate yourself, and I think it's just going to help your business in the long run. Matt, that is excellent information. We do have a question um, from someone who said, what do you do for a plan if you are a home care provider? So you don't have a brick and mortar, you're going into other people's homes. Um, I would take a look at that industry guidance. Um, and, and what you need to think about is every point of contact that you have with someone that you're obviously, I mean, a home service provider, I'm not sure if this means um, someone who's cleaning homes, or, cleaning or um, like daycare, we've got daycare providers, cleaning homes, you know, um, home health care, things like that. Uh, home health care would, would fit within the health care category. So you'd be thinking about, um, you'd be thinking about a lot of the same things that a health care provider would. Um, with regard to uh, preparedness plans, I would, I would say go to that link in the industry uh, page that I had in, in the slide relating to the preparedness plans. Then also look at the sample preparedness plan. There are, there's a lot of helpful information in there uh, that if you look at the industry that most closely resembles what you're doing, whether it's cleaning someone's home, whether it's going and providing home care uh, as a personal care attendant or, a, um, or a, a nurse, those things are all different, obviously. Uh, but that, that guidance is very helpful on the Department of Labor and Industries website. Wonderful. Matt, that is great information. And, and like, ever, uh, like Matt said, we will make the PowerPoint as well as the webinar available to everyone so that you can um, look through that. And we've got Matt's information up here on the screen. Um, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today for that great information. Oh, you know what? We, I think we might have one more question here before we go. Um, we have someone who asked, a company that has two employees and five family members, do all the same rules apply? 
Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the rules, but the, the, um, if you're talking about the rules in terms of um, the executive orders, um, yes, those would all apply across the board. I would say that the federal laws, typically the ADA, um, and you know, you have a lot of different federal laws that apply to employees. The Americans with uh, or the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, Title VII, which is your civil rights claims, um, and a lot of those laws do provide uh, protections to employees of larger employers. They do not apply to a small company um, like the one you described, but there are equivalents in state law, the Minnesota uh, Human Rights Act applies to small employers of, of one or more. So there, there you're gonna be covered by very similar laws. It's just kind of uh, dependent on, uh, on which law you're covered by. And I, and I would say they are, they are very similar and in practice they're, they're difficult to distinguish for most employers. They, they have a few nuances uh, where you get a jury trial under one and you don't get a jury trial under another one. But, um, for the most part, the the laws that I've described and the things that I've, I've talked about apply to small employers. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Matt, for this great information. Um, just to remind everyone, our next webinar will be next Wednesday, June 3rd. It is going to be with Glenn Starfield, who is a franchise owner of Express Employment and Pro Professionals. And Glenn is going to be talking about staffing trends during our uh, COVID pandemic here. And uh, again, this webinar was provided in partnership with the Apple Valley, Burnsville, Hastings, Lakeville, and River Heights Chambers of Commerce. And again, this recording will be made available on all of our partner websites. Matt, thank you again so much. That was excellent information. You are a, a great instructor. If you, if you ever leave law, you should become a teacher. You do a great job. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much and thank everyone. Um, have a great day. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Bye-bye.